Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Hartmann, and I am the CEO of Medicon Valley Alliance. And it's a true pleasure for me to welcome you all to today's uh, R&D network meeting. Um, this time, um, where we will focus on research infrastructures and open innovation platforms, and how we can accelerate innovation in both industry and academia. Uh, this network is uh, organized by us at Medicon Valley Alliance, obviously, as well as uh, our two members, uh, Alligator Bioscience, as well as uh, Medicon Village. And some of the initiatives we will discuss today are actually connected to the science parks uh, in the region, such as Medicon Village, for instance. So it makes total sense for us to work together with our two member companies here. And uh, I would also like to thank both Alligator and uh, Medicon Village for your support. That is highly appreciated. Before we start today's program, I would just like to take you through some of the household rules we have for this type of events. Uh, as you may have noticed, you're automatically muted while entering uh, this uh, meeting room. If you have any problems of uh, sort of technical issues, you can uh, use the Q and A. Uh, so uh, the chat function for um, uh, to get some help from uh, my colleagues and if you have questions you can of course use the Q&A functions uh, if you have questions for the presentations uh, to the speakers etc uh, and we will sort of uh, gather them and bring them up at the end of uh, this seminar. Please also note that uh, this uh, event will be recorded and you will receive a link afterwards so you can uh, enjoy the event afterwards as well. This uh, R&D network is not the only one that we at Medicon Valley Alliance uh, facilitate. We have in total five different networks. Uh, besides the R&D network, we also have an oncology network, a medtech network, a microbiome network, and an executive club network. And normally we arrange two to three meetings for each uh, network on a yearly basis. And as a member of Medicon Valley Alliance, you can attend, of course, these meetings uh, free of charge. Uh, you could also actually be part of organizing these meetings. And if you would like to know more on how to do that, and, and uh, you're more than welcome, of course, to contact me or my colleague, Sofia Nuros, after the event, and we will have a discussion with, with you on that. The program for today looks like this. And to help us, guide us through the program, we have invited a moderator, Kaisa M. Paulson, uh, to help us. Kaisa, please uh, turn on your camera. Kaisa is not only a professor at Lund University, she is also heading a, a large consortium of universities and uh, regional and international infrastructures, uh, working to support a better integration between our science communities uh, in Scandinavia and actually also Northern Europe. So Kaisa, would you be so kind and uh, help us guide us through this program? I would be delighted. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for organizing this uh, exciting session that we have ahead of us. And also thank you for inviting me to speak about Hanseatic League of Science or HALOS as we call it. So I will share my presentation now. Okay, so my name is, as Peter said, Kaisa Paulson, and uh, I work at Experimental Medical Science at the Faculty of Medicine at Lund University. I am the project manager of HALOS. I'm also the coordinator of the research infrastructure at our faculty. I also have some other assignments and most of them include competence development and something with research infrastructures. When I have some time left, I take care of my research group and we focus on MSc class one antigen presentation. And we have realized that we have a lot to win from using large scale research infrastructures. So here you see myself at the old Max laboratory so we do indeed use these techniques in different life science questions and uh, not only Max laboratory, but uh, also facilities in Denmark and in Germany and elsewhere 
in the world when we need and when we can get hold of beam time. So before talking about halos, I want to show you this picture. And it's not an overview because there are so many different initiatives of relevance if you want to, um, if you want to use the large scale facilities or learn more about them. But uh, I show you these examples of different initiatives that are out there, but uh, keep in mind there are many more. So if you're interested in funding opportunities, you can get funding from the Swedish Research Council, for example, or from Binova, Nordforsk, or also even from HALOS. If you want competence development or education one way or the other, there is a number of different research schools and uh, dedicated modules designed for the life science sector. These are primarily aimed at the academic uh, participants, but I would say that most of them are open also for participants from industry and the private sector. There is also a number of different initiatives that um, one way or the other link industry with academia and large scale facilities. And uh, one of the examples is uh, the Danish links initiative. But uh, we also have RISE that we will hear more about in the next talk. And uh, of course, Big Science Sweden and others are important players here. Here, I have listed some support structures and gateway environments. They are extremely important because before you go to the large scale facilities, you have to prepare your samples. And after you have been there, you need to take care of the data. And uh, Magdalena, she will talk about Open Lab Skåne later during this session. And uh, some other examples are, for example, the protein production platform at Lund University and uh, these um, facilities and competence centra that are there for data handling and image analysis. We also have Testa Center, of course, when you want to scale up and get really professional help. And uh, Jesper will tell you about Testa Center later today. I can also say that uh, even if something is uh, placed, for example, on this row, it doesn't mean that they are not involved in other categories, so to say. So it's just examples. Here we have a number of different initiatives that I think of like a foundation for everything that is done related to the large scale facilities. So for example, we have Lund Institute of Advanced Neutron and X-ray Science. And it's really a platform where many different types of activities are carried out. So please keep an eye on the LINKS website. There are many activities. Of course, we also have Science Village Scandinavia that is helping us to plan um, and execute what we want to build up at Brunsög between Max4 and ESS. And Medicom Valley Alliance is really creating opportunities for all of us. So it's also relevant in the context of Max4 and ESS to keep an eye on what Medicom Valley Alliance is involved in. Maxess Industry Arena I included because I think it's a fantastic database and it's quite newly launched. So if you want to search for different, uh, again, funding opportunities or collaboration opportunities, go to the Maxess Industry Arena website and um, browse around. I, I think it's very interesting. Very recently, something called InfaLife started. And this is a collaboration between ESS, Max4, and SciLife Lab. And there is more information on the web about this. But it's really dedicated for the life science sector again. So for us here today, I think this is also something to keep an eye on. Now we are almost approaching HALOS. But first, I want to mention the predecessor project. Before we started HALOS, we were part of a large EU project called ESS and Max4 Cross-Border Science and Society. And it was headed by Region Skåne, Eskil Mortensson, and Capital Region of Denmark with Jakob Öster. And one of the sub-projects in this giant project was called Max4 as Fun. 
And it was quite a large sub project. It actually consumed, I think, maybe 70% of the total budget. And within this sub project, we carried out not less than 194 projects utilizing directly or indirectly synchrotron light and or neutrons. Uh, we did all of this in cross-border constellations, um, which uh, proved to be really fruitful and successful, creating critical mass and getting beginners uh, in touch with someone that had previous expertise and hence could help them carry out these experiments. What was quite surprising, but also very satisfying, at least for me from the Faculty of Medicine point of view, was that 50% of the projects were from the life science sector. And this was open for all types of disciplines. And we thought really that these projects, these grants for carrying out projects would be low hanging fruits for other sectors, not uh, primarily for the life science sector. But indeed, this was a form of collaboration and a project form format that uh, was attractive for the life science sector. And they really took advantage and now started to use the large scale facilities. So with this as an incitement and also knowing that uh, our colleagues in the Hamburg area really wanted to do something together on the topic of large scale facilities, we started a new EU project. And this project was called Hanseatic League of Science, HALOS. It has been up and running since uh, February 2019, and the present funding period will end in July 2022. We have two different work packages, one for cross-border research. In this work package, we arrange seminars, webinars, workshops, educational initiatives of different um, formats, uh, and we also help out when it comes to matchmaking. If you have a question and you want to use the large scale facilities involving synchrotron light, neutrons, electrons, and or free electron laser light, you should look into HALOS and HALOS um, management and reference groups can help you to find a partner to carry out your project. We also have a work package for regional development. Um, and in this work package, we are working with um, mobility, remote access, innovation and tech transfer, as well as science cities. You might have heard of uh, one of the science cities, uh, maybe the one in Copenhagen or the one that is under construction and planning up at Brunsög in Lund. Or you might have heard of the one in Hamburg that is also in the construction and planning phase. Um, but uh, not everyone uh, were aware of all of these three science cities and that not every stakeholder involved in the planning either. So we are here, here really trying to engage and facilitate and contribute to a discussion where we can um, create synergy and complementarity between our three uh, regional science cities. So as you can see on this list, we are a number of partner organizations in HALOS. And um, of course, we have the large scale facilities, but we also have a, a number of academic organizations and regional development actors. And not least, we have Medicom Valley Alliance. We are really happy for that. Oslo University is also part, but uh, outside EU, so they are affiliated, not official part. So again, the heart of HALOS is really these four large scale facilities. And uh, they are complementary. You might know that Max4 and DSC both are synchrotron light sources, but they are not the same, same type of synchrotron light source and they do have different instruments. So there is a lot to learn. Uh, and uh, by engaging in HALOS, you can explore and understand the differences and similarities and uh, also get help, as I mentioned, to team up to get access to use one of these um, instruments. Of course, it will involve applying for beam time, etc. But uh, with the right help, uh, I think that uh, is uh, solvable. So, of course, we also look forward to the neutron source uh, ESS uh, being ready to use. 
but already now I want to point out that there is a lot of expertise and uh, uh, you can also use other neutron sources around the world in team with personnel from ESS. So even if it's not ready to be used up at Brunswick at the moment, you can still use the ESS personnel for collab collaborations. Uh, we also have the free electron laser source, uh, the European XFEL, which is complementary to, to these sources. And uh, yes, it's up and running and it's ready for you to uh, contact the personnel at European XFEL or someone in HALOS to, to get a route into this world. If you want to explore what um, we have, you can do it in many different ways. You can attend webinar series that we have. This is a series uh, that we started in the autumn and um, next week Cedric Dicko from Lund University will talk about how spectroscopy techniques can be used in life science with an outlook from the large scale facilities. We are also arranging um, imaging and image analysis workshop uh, and it will be the 18th of June we have put it out on the website and there will soon also be a link if you want to register for this event. We will here have uh, different presentations about the techniques, but also trying to give you some overview. For example, what is available when it comes to image analysis and what is available when it comes to complementary methods, not only what is existing at the large scale facilities, but what do we have that complement the large scale facilities. So keep an eye on this and please sign up if you're interested. Uh, during the autumn, we will have uh, two different autumn schools that you can sign up for, one at the University of Hamburg and one at DTU. We will also be part of the Tech Connect Europe that will have its first inauguration event in Europe this autumn, if everything goes as we wish with them. Corona situation, of course, but uh, here we will have several of the HALOS researchers presenting interesting projects. So please keep an eye and attend if you are interested. And this is really what uh, I also want to say to you today. Uh, please keep an eye on the Medicom Valley Alliance webpage for this event, because this will happen in January next year. So it's uh, quite some time from now. But this will be a dedicated session where we will really have a number of different examples and different uh, discussion sessions where you can get into deeper knowledge uh, about what can be done with the large scale facilities in the life science sector. And uh, Sophia is uh, the contact person for this, but uh, you can also contact uh, anyone in HALOS. We will all help out and organize uh, this event and uh, try to make it as attractive as possible, both for academia and for industry. So that was all I wanted to say. Um, contact information here. We have a Danish coordinator, Mikael Kajhede, and we have a German coordinator, Arvind Pearson. And more information is also available on the web page. So thank you for that. Now I will also stop sharing. And uh, I notice I have something in the chat, but that is not from you because you will write in the Q&A session uh, or the Q&A yeah, function and we will uh, take the questions in the end, but uh, please be active and uh, share your reflections, comments and questions in the Q&A function. With this, I now would like to welcome the next speaker. And that is uh, Anna. Uh, um, now I need to close this. Sorry. Anna, uh, if you please join, I will introduce you. So Anna Riederstad Volberg uh, will now talk about RISE and she will tell you about the pharma office uh, as an entry point for drug development. And I leave the word to Anna. 
So, okay, I thank you for inviting me. I hope you can see me and my slides now. So, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to talk about RICE infrastructure for drug development. Uh, but first I thought I would say something about RICE and where my department fits in. Um, so RICE uh, was formed 2016. It is a merger. I have to put on my watch, sorry. So there we are. It's a lot of electronic things here today. Uh, it was a merger uh, between different Swedish research companies and we are about almost 3000 employees that are divided into five different divisions based on competence, capabilities and research areas. And spanning over the divisions, we have the um, business and innovation areas aiming to, to connect different capabilities for to develop new offerings. And my department, chemical processes and pharmaceutical development, belongs to the division bioeconomy and health. And we are roughly 130 people divided into six different units based on different capabilities. And we also have a technology unit that supports us. Uh, and who are we? Um, initially, our organization was formed from the legacy of AstraZeneca uh, process and pharmaceutical R&D and, and um, safety pharmacology in Södertälje, as well as the Institute for Surface Chemistry at KTH. But nowadays we have expertise merging from many different organizations and pharmaceutical companies in the, from the Swedish ecosystem. And as you can see, we are quite spread out from Stockholm to Södertälje. The toxicology unit just moved into the rest of us in, in the södertälje Snäckviken area. And if you look at Google Maps, we are placed in two different buildings in the middle of the AstraZeneca area. And here you can also find Bioation Park, which has 30 to 40 small companies, not all in life science, but most of them are. And we also have here the Södertälje Science Park and KTH. So this is a really good milieu for interacting between different companies. But going back to my department, uh, I will focus on this. And we have many different target groups and, and customers, and we can work in many different ways. Uh, as a uh, government-owned public company, we are independent. Um, and in being so, we often take the role as a coordinator or project leader in different collaborations projects. Uh, and I will give one example for that. But we can also take the role as an external R&D or infrastructure, which is quite common when we work with the larger pharma companies. For small SMEs uh, that perhaps don't have so much money for each step, we can provide, for instance, tailored support that takes the company to the next milestone step or, uh, or the next decision point where they then can decide where to continue. We can work on specific questions or we can work long term with one company solving one question at a time. Our research and innovation projects that we have quite a lot, about 30% uh, uh, of our turnover is, is funded by research and innovation projects. The aim is really to build knowledge which in turn will result in new offerings. But how does our range of offering looks like, look like in, in our department? Based on our core competences and capabilities, our infrastructure relates to pharmaceutical development of drug products up to phase 2B, as well as safety and toxicology. For chemical drugs, we can produce a drug substance and we have, have all the necessary components for that are related to GMP, such as formulation, analysis, um, manufacturing and release and the quality control system. We can also address other modalities such as protein drugs, peptides and oligonucleotides. For biological drugs, um, our focus at the moment is formulation development, structure analysis and characterization. In the safety and toxicology unit, uh, 
we can divide our activities at an overview levels into four different areas. The in, in silico prediction activities, um, you will get um, a risk assessment really on, on your drug and also on, on the target that, that you are approaching. And it's quite wise to do that really early in, in the drug discovery program. And we can also simulate, for instance, uh, exposure that you can expect from this drug in this uh, model, in different models. Uh, in the in vivo um, facilities, we have mice and rats, and we can perform all the regulatory GLP tox studies and combine them with, uh, with the necessary bioanalysis and histopathology. But we can also run other pharmacological models and we have the biological safety level two if that would be necessary. Our in vitro lab um, can perform safety assessment in vitro tests as well as other immunological tests and assays with standard immunology molecular biology instrumentation. Uh, and the GLP bioanalysis lab uh, can measure exposure of different molecules in a wide range of fluids, as well as biomarkers and perform protein characterization. So also these facilities that initially were aimed for only toxicology, as you see, we start to use them for other more innovative solutions. If you search on the RISE webpage um, with the search term drugs, you can find a lot of diverse uh, stories, projects, expertise, and so on. And this really highlights how we use the broad expertise within whole, whole RISE to, to form new type of solutions. And for instance, as you can see here, AI and machine learning, we start to use in many different instances. And in this case, we use it to optimize chemical synthesis and process development, and that can be both for our own processes, but also for our customer processes. Um, but if you come as an SME and want to get help, this can be quite confusing. Perhaps you don't even know what you are looking for. Already today, you can contact us to have a first discussion and we can help you to find the right way. But we feel we want to make it easier for the SME to find it directly. And therefore, we are now, now building a new entrance for SMEs and others to, to access the whole uh, range of competences within RISE. An SME may need support to understand the complexity of drug development and to do the right thing from the start. And we are developing at PharmaOffice some tools to support you in the best way. And the checklist, which is also under construction, will contain the different steps that are important in drug development. And the aim is that this can be used for your planning, but it can also be used as a basis, for instance, for due diligence or for, for checking what do I need to do in the next step. And the aim is also to put together an expert panel with experts that are representing different parts in, in the drug discovery chain so that the, an SME can meet them all at the same time and discuss the project in a wider sense and where it's heading. Um, so the aim is that you get the best support um, at one point and to discuss, um, discuss that with the expert. As I said, it is under construction, but you can already now find it on our web page and access and, and um, submit your question to this. Uh, of course, the pharma office will be open to others as than SMEs, um, but um, it's formed for the purpose of SMEs. So I have a look at my watch again. So RISE can support you in, in the journey. And as I said, we are focusing on the drug product. And even if we are not doing all the steps along the way, we have experts that have knowledge uh, about the whole um, journey, which means that when we meet this, the companies in the early phase, we can actually uh, help the companies to have the line in sight and to, to understand what, what do I have to do early to get the best result in the end. So the important thing is, what is your question? And I have some examples of questions that we can help you to address, such as what are the risks of interfering with this target or drug molecule? 
What happens to protein structure if we change from a dry to wet formulation? Or how do I go from lab scale to industrial scale production? Or can I conjugate my chemical compound to an antibody? Or just can you produce one gram of compound so that I can do my in vivo tox study? Questions that, like that we can help you with. I will now show you two examples on how we work to furthermore illustrate how, how, dif how we can work in different ways. So this first example is a small company and the rice store with Umicrine started already 2013 um, as a consultation because that is often how it starts. It continued with experimental work on formulation development and we had to address the solubility of the compound in order to get enough exposure in the CNS. It resulted in the lipid formulation, which was used in preclinical proof of concept studies and continued further into the clinical studies. And right now over 100 people have been treated with this compound, uh, which RICE has been involved in the formulation and manufacturing and the G GMP release from, which is quite exciting actually. Another example how we can work is as a coordinator of a project and Next Biofarm, which you might have heard of, is a Vinova funded project with 18 partners, which is both from academia and industry, both small and big companies. And the aim of this project is to develop better formulations for biological drugs. And here RICE is the coordinator, as I said. Um, and uh, for this project, the large scale research infrastructures, as um, we just heard about, are uh, key resources. And also some of the main goals of the Next Biofarm project can really be addressed with these infrastructures. Uh, but RICE, as you also heard, has a key role in the large scale infrastructures to, to really connect them with, with the industry part. And just from my own perspective, I'm not a physical chemist and it's quite difficult to understand how, how this infrastructure can be used in drug discovery and development. Which kind of questions can be answered? Uh, and this type of concrete uh, projects, as you find in the next biofarm, is really a way to actually conceptualize which questions can be answered by these infrastructures, which I think is a good way. And you have an entrance to us in this um, in this activity from our web page. So finally, and I think this was almost a bit more than 10 minutes. Um, so from RISE, you can get um, uh, competence and capabilities in drug development, and we are really happy to support you in your journey. We are independent. You will own your own IP and we work in flexible ways. And we're now developing pharma office as an entrance for small companies to easily access the help they need. So, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Fantastic to know more about RICE and the, the Pharma office. So, we move on directly to next speaker, and that is Jesper Hedberg, who is the director of Testa Center up in Uppsala. So, a bit away from oh. here, but uh, it's really available also for users from far distance. And please, Jesper, tell us. Thank you very much. So I'll start with sharing my presentation. Hi, everyone. My name is Jesper Hedberg. So I'm the very proud director of Testa Center. Uh, so first off, thanks, Kaisa, for introducing us. And thanks, MBO, for, for letting us speak to, uh, during this session today. It's very valuable. And I hope to be able to communicate the values that you might be able to achieve in Testa Center, regardless of your geographical location. So we are a test bed for biology, biology and technology around biological production. We have a vision. So the vision is that we together, and please note that I, we start with the word together, that we together change the, the journey of world-changing innovations. 
So the together world would then uh, describe that, of course, Testa Center is a part of that, but also the projects that are run in Testa Center, uh, academic or commercial, also together with other infrastructures in Sweden in the Nord and also Northern Europe, as well as technology providers and instrument vendors. I think that the pandemic, if not the, anything else, has shown us that we can't do things on our own, so we need to do things together. So we hope to focus a lot on that. We try to achieve this vision by enabling researchers to verify the innovations in an env environment which is production-like. And the production-like environment then helps researchers and projects to accelerate the industrialization of these innovations. We also have a third leg that we stand on, uh, the, that is the secure excellence. So the development of biological production the last 10 years has been extremely rapid. So we're lagging a little bit around competence globally, I would say, but definitely also in Sweden, both on student level and research level. So secure that excellence and secure that competence for the future manufacturing of biological drugs is super important. As a background, we are a joint initiative between the Swedish government and Saitiva to support growth of life science, and then more specifically around biological production. We're open both internationally and nationally uh, for biological production. Uh, we're open to academia, we're open to startups, and I would say that those two focus groups are our main focus groups, but we're also open for larger industries as well, such as, for instance, Saitiva. Also important to say is that we're, of course, uh, open for biological innovation, meaning then, of course, new molecules or new ways of expressing a molecule or new viruses, for instance, or something like that. But we're also open for technological innovation. So a big angle around biological production is a technological angle and also then including the digital innovation. So we need to include the technical, digital and biological innovation in one house, so to say, to get the full leverage of this. We describe ourselves as an industrial infrastructure lab. So what does that mean? We have tried to create an environment which is similar to a production environment, but we're non-GMP, meaning that you cannot generate clinical material here, but you can do the scalability experiments and you can do the risk reduction when going up in scale towards a production, uh, production process here in Testa Center. We're also open for educational activities. So primarily today, Uppsala University uh, does a lot of student exercises here in Testa Center, but we also are open for other educational organizations. Uh, study visits and courses are a common activity in that sense. And just a note then, we are operated and owned by Saitiva, but we're defined as a non-profit legal entity. And we're also separate from the large legal entity of Saitiva. Yeah. Right. Our offering then. So when you come to Testa Center as a research group, uh, you get access to the production equipment and the production lab that we have here. Along with that, not everyone is familiar with how to run a production bioreactor, for instance. So you get the technical support, both to plan your project prior to coming here, which actually very often is quite a significant time uh, that you need to spend on that planning. But also while you're here, you can get help or you get help from our specialists so that you do your scaling up experiments side by side by experts that has done lots of bioprocessing from before. As you see, we do not provide uh, resources, direct resources. So we're not the contracting organization in that sense. We don't take assignments. So the intention is that research groups and small companies come to Testa Center to perform the projects within their organization. Not everyone has the competence needed to run, for instance, a large bioreactor if that is what needed. Uh, so we also have a connection network to uh, enable uh, organizations to contract competence into their project. So independent contractors and also other contractors are uh, a part of our network. So we'll be happy to help you with, with engaging in those activities. We have four bioprocessing labs. 
four manufacturing suites, if you will. They are all designed to harbor a start to finish process, what we call them, meaning that taking a frozen vial of cells, expanding that into bioreactors, harvest and protein purification all the way down to pure protein is possible in our labs. That's the core uh, scope of our technologies. We do not in Testa Center specifically have cell line development, but we do have contacts that can help with cell line development. We do not in Testa Center have formulations, as uh, for instance, Anna Riedestad Vorberg talked about, but we do have contacts uh, that you can help. So that's our main scope technology-wise. Technology a little bit more detailed instrumentation list. Uh, this slide is very busy, I'll take you through it. But if you would like to know more specifically each instrument what we have, you can download it on, from our homepage, testacenter.com. Briefly then, we have the cell culture equipment to grow uh, both mammalian cells and microbial cells. The mammalian capability are all the way up to 500 liters. Uh, from, of course, then the shaker incubator size. And the microbial cells are today up to 50 liters. And within a couple of weeks, actually, we are uh, also commissioning a uh, microbial bioreactor up to 200 liter. That particular reactor will be a stainless steel variant. Then we have the harvesting equipment needed to match those scales. So if you would like to go with a centrifugation option, we have, of course, the batch centrifuge, which are not super scalable, but we also have a collaboration ship with Alfa Laval uh, to offer a, a continuous centrifuge. And then we also have the filtering solutions. Saitiva is by heritage a downstream company. It's today Saitiva covers the whole offering, but of course uh, in Uppsala we are uh, have a lot of instrumentation and knowledge around downstream processing of proteins. So I would I think it's safe to say that we'd have any instrumentation that you might need on the downstream side, including the hardware for the columns. When it comes to analytical capabilities, we've actually quite limited today. It's relatively basic analytical capabilities. The analytical capabilities that we have are there to support a run of a process. So uh, metabolite analysis, microscope, cell counters, and then basic protein analytics like HPLC, SDS page. And we also have a gyro lab and an HPLC from Gyros and uh, Agilent respectively. We've collected some of the feedback from projects that have been here. Um, so depending on the objectives of each project, of course, uh, they give different feedback. But many of the feedback statements that we get revolve around scalability manufacturing manufacturability. So going up in scale, then you need to show that it's the process that you're aiming for is actually scalable and that the molecule that you're producing doesn't fall apart or precipitate or disappear so that it's actually manufacturable. Many of the academic groups that come to Testa Center has a need for larger amounts of protein material. So we just have a, had a, a academic group doing an exit from Testa Center where they produced material enough for last uh, a couple of years in their, in their lab. And the PhD student who did an exit said, that's perfect, I don't need to prep anymore. Uh, I used to prep once a month. Now I, I have my, my one protein prep that I can have in the fridge or freezer, to be honest, I don't remember which one, in the cold storage uh, that will last me the rest of my PhD period. So that's kind of the things that we really love to, to hear because that saves them time. Also, when going up in scale and starting to aim for an industrialized project and starting to aim for something to contract when you actually want to do a GMP uh, production at a CDMO, you, it's always really good to know how your process work. You're a better requester and you're a better troubleshooter when things go wrong. Uh, fail early and adjust, uh, uh, not always fun to realize that things doesn't work, but it's very important to realize that quick so that you can pivot and adjust. And then around the equipment park, we get lots of feedback that the equipment that we have is flexible. We can roll them in and out in the, in the labs, so that saves time as well. We are a production environment, which means that we have an overhead which is uh, uh, larger than a standard, uh, uh, say, so to say, small scale lab, which means that we need to cover our costs with an access fee. 
Uh, this cost is uh, uh, usually higher than the standard bench fee, which means that there, this is a significant investment for many of the companies coming here. But we have a great opportunity together with Vinova to offer some verification funding. So if there is a need uh, within a project uh, that has a commercialization uh, goal, uh, there's a possibility to apply for up to 800,000 Swedish crowns. Uh, you need to co-fund with 30% of your own uh, financing within the project then. Very shortly, in 30 seconds, so we're non-profit. We give you expert support around your non-GMP lab uh, experiments for biological production, and we're a private-public partnership. You will get access to unique equipment park, access to unique expertise, Paper usage instead of cupping, capex, and you'll get the professional network. Uh, what many of the projects aim to achieve is to reduce the risk when going up in scale and also build the process know-how so that when you take the project to the next step, you know where you're going. This in turn then gives the project a value increase. And very important to say the last note there, uh, uh, ownership of IP and results remain with the client as they exit from Testa Center. So Testa Center or Cytiva do not claim uh, any rights to any of the results that are generated in Testa Center. Very short picture, these are the companies and academic groups that's been in Testa Center. We have, uh, of course, a lot of companies in the Uppsala Stockholm region, but are also starting to reach out to, to the other parts of Sweden. So we have Lund University here actually as we speak, together with the Royal Institute of Technology in one of our labs upstairs. Uh, we have Sikkum from Lund. We have uh, uh, at least two Danish companies. We have Finnish companies, Estonian companies, and companies from UK and Great Britain. So we're starting to reach uh, outside the borders of Sweden as well. With that, I'd like to say thanks a lot. And if you're interested to know more, please reach out. You have my email there, and we also have a question session after the speakers today. Uh, so. Uh, with that, uh, many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Jesper. And we move on to next speaker, and that is Magdalena Almien from Malmö University. And she will tell us how we can access the resources at Open Lab Skåne. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much for inviting me to tell you more about Open Lab Skåne. Uh, my name is Magdalena Almien. And I work at Biofilms Research Center for Biointerfaces at Malmö University. I'm also project leader of Open Lab Skåne. So the Open Lab Skåne project started in uh, two, 2017 and will last for six years. And it's a collaborative project between Malmö University, Lund University and Smile Incubator. And it's also supported by the European Regional Development Fund and the region of Skåne. So what we do uh, is that we, we have opened up our sites to offer um, companies access to equipment, expertise and uh, laboratories. And uh, we have uh, three focus areas that uh, also correspond to our three different sites. Uh, of course, there is some overlapping of, of resources at the different sites, but our focus areas are material science and chemistry, life science, and also uh, food engineering. Uh, so Malmö University site is uh, located at Biofilms Research Center for Biointerfaces. And here you find equipment and expertise within uh, material science and chemistry. Uh, this site is located uh, next to Medeon Science Park. And since we have a quite large uh, instrument park, there are of course many areas of use for our equipment, but a lot of the equipment can be used for material characterization to get to know your products better. And here I have listed some of the available equipment. 
And I want to give you some examples of what companies have been doing at this site. Uh, we have the AFM that you see here on the first picture uh, to, from the left, uh, atomic force microscope, and it can be used for uh, studying surfaces. And then we have a company that use differential scanning calorimetry to study interactions between starch particles and water. And these particles uh, are used for drug delivery. And then we have an, an NMR that's used for uh, mostly for identification of small organic compounds. And uh, uh, our scanning electron microscope that you see here on the second image from the left is a quite popular instrument among companies because it's a very versatile instrument that uh, uh, can be used to study a lot of yeah, different materials. And uh, now we also have a new instrument for small and wide angle X-ray scattering. And you can use it, for example, for uh, pilot projects before going to a large scale facilities as uh, MAX4. And it's the instrument here, a second image from the, the right. And if you have, for example, a skin product and you want to study how it moves across skin, we have uh, in vitro diffusion equipment for such study. And both the electron microscope and the X-ray instruments are highlighted in our Open Lab Skiona videos that you can watch if you want at our website. Okay, then we move on to life science and Smile Incubator. And Smile have opened up its resources to companies that are not members of the incubator. And you find them at Medicon Village in Lund. And SMILE have a wide range of equipment, for example, cell laboratories, equipment for biological analysis, imaging equipment, and equipment for protein production and analysis. And most companies that SMILE are within the pharma development sector, but there are also companies from like cosmetics and, uh, and the food industry. Oh, and our third site uh, is located at Lund University and the Department of Food Engineering, Engineering and Nutrition. And this is actually one of Sweden's strongest research, research environments when it comes to food engineering. And here you can find a lot of resources for processing, formulation and characterization of food products. And of course, there are many different uh, companies coming here using this facility. For example, we have microbreweries, bakeries, companies developing vegan products and so on. So that was our three different sites. So two in Lund and one site in Malmö. So how does Open Labs Geona work? Well, you can say it's a very straightforward process uh, at our website. You'll find information about contact persons for each of the three sites, and they can answer if we are able to match your specific requirements with our available resources. But the general idea with Open Labs Geoni is that companies come and use the equipment themselves with some initial um, support, of course, and there are some exceptions of very advanced equipment. So you can say it's a kind of do-it-yourself concept. And uh, some of the benefits that we hope to achieve with uh, the project is uh, we want to facilitate innovation and development of products by supporting companies. And we want to uh, facilitate collaboration between companies and researchers that work at our sites. But when companies come and use equipment, they work side by side with our researchers and make new com contacts and hopefully also can, uh, which can lead to new collaborations. And we also arrange uh, focus seminars where we would like to promote uh, networking. And the sustainability part is that 
by opening up our sites, we increase the use of existing equipment and hopefully reduce consum consumption of new equipment. And uh, as I said, at our website, openlabscane.se, you can find all available equipment listed. And you can also watch our new movies that highlight some of the equipment. So yeah, that was shortly about Open Love Skeone. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Magdalena. And now we will move on to the talks from the industry side. And uh, the first one to speak is Christian Clausen, who is the Chief Scientific Officer at Bioneers. Please, Christian. Hello, Kaiser. I hope you can hear me. I'll just uh, share my presentation here. We'll start. So, I hope you can see. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, for the invitation for this uh, exciting meeting. I will take you briefly through uh, the facilities that we uh, have uh, and have used in collaboration with uh, companies and research groups, both here in Denmark and, and Sweden and uh, internationally. So, um, shift here. So, just briefly about uh, Baronia, uh, we are a specialty CEO uh, and we work with, uh, uh, with the customized research solutions and using our advanced facilities um, to assist. Uh, companies and collaborate with research groups within the life science field. And to the companies, we are essentially their strategic R&D partner. We are also uh, part of the Danish RTO, net RTO network, uh, meaning that we invest and develop uh, forefront technologies and facilities to be on the top of the needs uh, out there and, uh, and to, to offer you can say uh, uh, technologies and facilities that are uh, a little bit ahead uh, of the market. We have a very strong scientific foundation and we are 65 employees with, uh, with, with strong scientific backgrounds. Um, and we are located in three sites. We have our headquarters in Hersom, uh, that is north of Copenhagen. And we have a a site inside, inside Copenhagen on the Pharmaceutical Institute at Copenhagen University. Uh, and we have a small office in Lund. And we are founded in 1982 and has been a strategic partner for companies and research groups uh, for all the years uh, since, uh, since then. See here. So we have a binary two main focus areas. Uh, that we have uh, defined uh, and in which our facilities they uh, work and I'll come back to that. I have after this slide two uh, case uh, projects to illustrate how we uh, use our facilities uh, in collaborations with uh, companies. But the first uh, focus area is early stage drug candidates um, and in this in, within this area, we, we work uh, uh, with the production of recombinant proteins uh, and characterization of, of proteins. We work with formulation of small molecules and, and peptides, and as well as characterization and delivery systems of these. In the second area, the in vitro modeling, we uh, work or we have uh, a, a, a variety of different human cell models uh, and our focus indications is within immune, the immune system is the CNS and cancer. And additionally, we have predicted organ models uh, in our site in Copenhagen, uh, where we analyze uh, drug absorption uh, and drug formulations, for example, in a gastric, a dynamic gastric mod platform. So this is to give you an overview uh, on some of our facilities and these uh, bubbles that you see here, they can also be of course uh, combined. Uh, and this is also what we often see when in, in, in our various collaborations. Um, but one thing is of course the facilities, uh, the, the most important 
elements uh, and components of, 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 of our daily lives that is of course the experts behind the facilities and uh, they are really key to, to drive the collaborations uh, between uh, us and, and, and our partners. And as you can see, we are really a cross-disciplinary team here at Bionia, uh, covering many of the disciplines uh, in, in drug development. Um, and also our, as you can see, our uh, facilities uh, and, and the, the, the different uh, technologies that we have also cover a wide range of elements in the, in the drug discovery and drug development chain. So I'll jump to uh, the first uh, case uh, here, and that is uh, in the focus area that we call the vitro modeling. And uh, so, so that is uh, within uh, these uh, cell models that I uh, mentioned before. So the task here uh, was to develop a neurodegenerative cell model for compound screening. And if you see in the, in the inner circle, uh, this is the illustration of the product elements. Uh, and the blue uh, circle is in the facilities that we use to, to actually solve such a project. Um, so such a project starts uh, always with the generation of a specific cell line that could be a Alzheimer's specific cell line, for example, with CRISPR technology or another gene editing technology. Then we develop uh, neuronal cell cultures uh, consisting, of, consisting of neuronal subtypes and we move that into our screening facility and begin to screen uh, uh, compounds involved in the project. And that ends in, of course, in the massive data output that we need to analyze. So the, the facilities involved is molecular biology labs that is tuned for uh, effective genetic engineering. Then we move into our self culture facilities that we have uh, uh, many of in the, in the lab facilities here at Hossam. And uh, we also have very advanced microscopic platforms. And this kind of, these kind of projects use these microscopic platforms to uh, evaluate the, the neuronal cell cultures that we have developed. And then we move into our advanced high quality imaging screen platforms where we can create these uh, data sets uh, that we then use our analytical tools to, to, uh, to analyze. I will also say sometimes the collaborations that we do, that can also be only in one of these, uh, in one of these parts. So for example, col collaborating around only high content image uh, based screening, it doesn't have to necessarily, a project doesn't have to contain all the, all the elements. You can kind of pick and choose uh, depending on the needs. The next uh, case project, just to illustrate how we use uh, the other part of uh, the, the other part of Bionia, uh, in the early stage drug candidate area, that is to generate a recombinant protein, and then make the chain transfer to a CMO for DMP production. Because we uh, also do not produce uh, to DMP scale uh, Bionia, at least not for now. Uh, but the product here is a traditional product. So we start to make the D design and then develop the cell line, uh, go into upstream process development with cultivation or fermentation uh, in mammalian or microbial hosts, uh, further down to downstream process uh, with protein purification and analytics development. And we, we can take that even further to both uh, formulations and stability studies to make a full pre-CMC package that can be tech transferred to a CMO. And for these, uh, for such a project, we again use uh, our molecular biology labs that are, are actually the oldest labs here at Bionia, some of, some of the competences that we have had since uh, 1982. Uh, we have uh, cryo storage facilities to, to, to storage the research bank, cell banks that we, use, uh, that we produce. And we have uh, different kind of scales, uh, 15 liter bioreactors for the microbial work. Um, and of course, uh, different shaker platforms, shaker flask platforms as well, and batch and fit batch equipment. In the protein or in the downstream process uh, thing, we have a 
protein lab that uh, have state of the art uh, state of the art purification platforms available and a range of different analytical uh, methods up and running um, yeah and the formulation of stability is mainly done in the at our site in Copenhagen where we have uh, experts there that can be that can that they have this expertise uh, to do that So, when you collaborate with us, uh, we have a really, really highly advanced uh, infrastructure that cover many of the key steps in drug discovery and development. So, uh, as I just really briefly illustrated, we can both produce, uh, for example, biologics, uh, and we can also uh, analyze these uh, candidate compounds in in different kind of uh, cell models and use some of the advanced uh, infrastructures that we have here to, to get uh, really uh, uh, dive deep into the, into the details of mechanisms of safety. We have a multidisciplinary team of scientists in the different departments uh, that uh, also come from industry with industry backgrounds, uh, many of them that can really uh, uh, they really know the, the drug development uh, uh, chain. And we uh, also, uh, is an experienced partner in public-private partnerships that we also uh, prioritize a lot because it's, it is really key for us to continue to, to, uh, to develop our technologies and facilities. And we can only do that in collaboration with uh, with partners in in Denmark and, and uh, internationally, of course. So, so we we are a partner in both EU EU projects and uh, national projects as well. So I think that was the last slide. I only have a context slide. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I think the chat is open. Thank you, Christian. And we move directly to the last talk before we then go to the question session. And the last talk will be given by Niklas Nilsson, and he is the head of the R&D Open Innovation at Leo Pharma. Welcome, Niklas. Hello, thank you for the introduction. I'm just going to try to uh, find my screen here. So let me just get a confirmation that uh, my screen can be seen. It's seen. Looks good. good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the organizers uh, for inviting me to speak today. Uh, my name is Niklas Nilsson. I'll, I work as head of open innovation at Leo Pharma in Denmark. And I will present today briefly what we can offer you as part of research infrastructure, but also how potentially the industry and all of us can work differently with openness in mind. There we go. So when we think about partnering, collaborating and working with others, we like to think about the greater ecosystem. Because as the white line says here, that we are all interdependent and my success depends on your success. And it's a, it's a simple statement, but it's important to realize that if you want to get new treatment to the patients, we have to work with others. And it's getting more and more important that we can't do it alone. And we've heard many great speakers all there today, so, uh, providing resources and capabilities to, to make that happen together. And, uh, <clears throat> and so the Leo Pharma Open Innovation Platform offers free access to research resources. And I will go into that what that means later, but it's in a way for us to engage with our potential partners uh, to also provide a low risk and easy support for those who would like to work with us or like to explore if they can work with us. And we like to use this as a way to explore new innovation opportunities. And as a company, we really look for partners to find them more of them, to find them faster and to find completely new ones that we have that we don't even know about before. That's kind of what we like to, to achieve. And the science that we offer at Leo Pharma Open Innovation is the science that Leo Pharma is partially driving towards finding new treatments for dermatology and particularly inflammation 
uh, in, in the skin. And I'm just going to briefly tell you what that is. So to the far left, uh, the, 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 hash, the, the left side of the screen, we have two phenotypic disease-relevant assays. They're based on human keratinocytes and based on human T cells. I won't go into the, the details of the science today, but we offer molecules to be tested in these assays for free with no strings attached. That's the short slogan. And the whole open innovation process here means that anyone who works with more molecules or modalities that can have an effect and information, we can test those in our labs to see if there is any effect in our assays. We also developing this platform further. So we have new assays being developed right now and that will be put online this year. And also as a, actually this year, we also launched another aspect of open innovation where we are more clear about the targets that we'd like to find partners to help us with. And that is specifically uh, small molecules that have a PPI capabilities, a protein-protein interaction or inhibiting protein-protein interactions. And we look for partners who can help us find molecules targeting the IL-4 receptor and the STAT-6 transcription factor. So this is a way for us to disclose both what we need as in scientific business opportunities, but also provide the resources and the means for someone else to actually see if they have something that might work in our assays, in our pipeline and our science. So that is what we have, and we can offer that in a completely different way. And also keep in mind, we are from a company, we're looking for partners, we need to find partners, we are not a CRO. So that is also what we can do it in this way. So come on in, we're open for business. And usually what you see when you work at a pharma company, you will have perhaps a lot of conditions. Maybe we will retain all the conditions, uh, all the rights. Maybe we won't give you the results. Maybe uh, we need the first right to negotiate or commercialize. Uh, there might be, or there are usually some fine print in that contract. For open innovation, we took away all those hurdles. And so what does that mean in reality? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> Here is actually the, the one slide I would like to talk most about today. Excuse me. So here is the green arrow showing the industry R&D process that we all know very well, beginning in the very beginning of finding a new drug target, exploring all the chemistry, then moving on to uh, lead optimization, maybe in vivo studies, formulation and clinical trials. Capabilities that we heard about before can help you move forward. But for us, we need to find partners who can help us fuel our pipeline and drive our science forward. And traditionally, it's we do always work with partners, but it's a little difficult because there's a barrier and there's legal and there's business. And my slides move by themselves, by the way. And uh, <clears throat> there it takes usually between six and 12 months to negotiate a, a material transfer agreement. And it's complicated for the partner outside our pipeline to know what we do. So in open innovation, we solve that problem by actually opening up part of our research pipeline. So that means the dashed line here symbolizes an open part of our research capabilities. And right now that means the assays and the targets I just show you. So a biotech partner can see what we have and they can also freely engage and try those resources to see if it works for them. So this is the openness uh, aspect of being transparent of what we have. We're being transparent uh, about who can use it. And we're also giving full access to someone else to utilize these resources for us to explore the science and for them to explore us as a potential partner for them. And this in reality means that we can work with many, many more biotech partners than we could before. <clears throat> Since we took away all the usual hurdles to sign a contract, we can work with many, many more biotechs. We can make it faster. And we can also work with biotechs who find us uh, more relevant. So um, because we have a transparency in the science that we provide. So therefore, we can generate many more interactions by using an open innovation platform. But it also means, of course, that uh, we're not, we don't have anything. We don't have something for everyone, so to speak. We have currently have a focus on small molecules, partially also peptides and biologics, but mostly small molecules. And we have something to offer partners who have something in that area. Uh, 
and we have some to offer to see if the partner can explore if if the asset they have matches the science needs and businesses that we have. And the open mission platform was designed to work with biotechs, but it also evolved and we have now been able to work with many different kinds of partners and roles in the entire ecosystem. So here I would like to go through as kind of the last slide to exemplify what value can we create for different partners out there in the ecosystem by using our open innovation platform. The first example is the biotech. I already told you that they, they have a way, they have a need to perhaps uh, find a partner who can assess their assets or technology uh, and bring it forward towards the clinic. Really important aspect for biotech to survive is to find a partner who they can collaborate with. We can, we can offer that aspect in our operation platform. And then we have, excuse me, my slides are really jumpy today. It's like I got their own life. For other pharma companies also work with us and it's a great opportunity for them to explore if perhaps they have shelved assets, something they, they like to repurpose or simply to explore a different market or different disease area than what they usually do. And since we are focused on dermatology, it's a great way for other pharma companies to look if they have something that could go into a dermatology uh, area. Patients, is that actually something we also have explored with? Uh, and some patients realize that an open science platform that this one is, is a way for them to actually engage in their own disease. Uh, not for all patients, but patients with a scientific interest and a scientific training actually have found this platform to be interesting to work with. <clears throat> and as an example, we had a hackathon like two years ago where we invited everyone, uh, entrepreneurs, students, and also patients to help us work with new drug targets for eczema. That's because we have an open science platform, open innovation platform, where we don't have to take the considerations of business and confidentiality as a first starting point. Physicians, it's also something that utilizes this platform, particularly physicians who also have uh, uh, research themselves. Maybe they like to find new drug targets uh, uh, for the diseases. And we are quite often testing reference molecule for physicians looking to expand the understanding of the disease and the pathways for disease that they're working with. Uh, and quite a bit of startups as well. And uh, startups is perhaps an early version of a biotech and they face a problem of uh, finding perhaps the interest of investors and also find the interest of a potential partner in the industry. And usually when a startup company comes to the industry and a pharma company, they're usually met by come back when you have some clinical data. And that is of course difficult for an early startup. So here the open innovation platform can really provide early data in research to help the startup navigate what is relevant, what is not relevant, and to get that industry feedback and get the discussions from this to going to help them perhaps strengthen their uh, discussion with the investors and also to figure out how they can create value for us. And also the spin outs is perhaps the very earliest stages of, of, a, of a company. Usually they still remain at the university lab, that it perhaps a virtual company, and they really need to kind of get a to pressure test the, the idea perhaps, and really need to have a discussion, a dialogue with industry. Is this something of relevance? What do we need to think about? Can we actually create some data that proves our points? And here again, the open innovation platform is great to create that data set that can be discussed uh, between the industry and the spin-off companies. Uh, also, both for spin-off companies, startups and biotechs, uh, the data we produce is owned by them. So it's a great way for them to create uh, additional data sets for, for publications, but also for grants. And also the platform has been used several times to support, uh, to provide an industry partner when they look for, for grants, both at, uh, in, in locally, both here in Sweden, Denmark, and also at NIH actually. And we're currently working with quite a, quite a few US biotechs that have found the platform really relevant to explore that early connection to the industry. And then last, we have the universities. Uh, first of all, uh, the university research groups that work with perhaps chemistry, uh, drug targets, uh, drug pathways. Uh, they really found this platform to be useful in the way of creating advanced biological data 
perhaps from assays that are not usually accessible for universities and getting that industry uh, feedback on their molecules. <clears throat> so that data can be used for publications and also to explore if they perhaps have something that could be worth considering to create as a spin-off company. And the last example from universities is that we work with also with educational aspects with university. So uh, currently we work with four, four universities uh, globally where students in the medicine and chemistry and students in drug design get introduced to a, a well-known drug target. They get introduced to uh, the scaffolds of molecules that work and some uh, tool, uh, some ideas of what they can do. And then based on their education, the professor and the assistants, they then design their own new molecules. They synthesize these molecules and then they send them to us to be tested. So here actually uh, the students get industry feedback on the molecules that they make as part of the education. And also the data and the, the molecules that are being produced as part of education are shared between the students and the universities. So the next batch of students can then build on the previous information. So it's like a little mini drug projects run by academia and students. So that was pretty much examples of how an open innovation platform uh, that is much more accessible to partners can create value to different roles in the ecosystems. And all of these roles are really important for us to drive basic science, to solve problems, to drive the science forward, to understand the translation aspect of science, and also to fuel the pipeline and create value for, for, for our patients. But one important aspect of the open innovation pattern is that we have designed it from the outside in, so to speak. So keeping in mind and understanding what are the needs from the external partners and how can we help them advance their science so their science actually also is relevant for us. I'm gonna go for the last slide that summarize what I just said in three key points. So again, this is from Leo Pharma Open perspective of how we can find partners and work with partners. So first of all, my, my main point is that collaborations work much better with an open innovation mindset. Keep that in mind when you sign the contract and when you look for opportunities. And uh, <clears throat> our platform adds to the joint research infrastructure by providing easy accessible resources for anyone to use. And there are more and more pharma companies working in this way, providing different kinds of resources, different kinds of needs to the public. And the last point here is you as a researcher or a scientist can potentially explore those kinds of resources for your benefits. So go out there, look what exists, find out how they work and see if you can use them to create value for your research, but also if you can identify needs for science that someone else have that potentially you can help uh, fill in. So that was it from Leo from Open Innovation, and I give the word back to Kaisa. Thank you, Mike, for your attention. Thank you, Niklas. And uh, yeah, I, I have really enjoyed all the presentations. <laughs> And Niklas, um, just because you were last, <laughs> let's start with a question to you. I think this uh, open innovation platform sounds like a great idea. And in Halos, we have worked within the tech transfer study to try to understand if and how different legal issues, ownership uh, patterns and similar are causing difficulties for cross-sector collaborations uh, regarding use of large-scale facilities. So. What you have come up with here at Leo Pharma, uh, why isn't that available at more companies? And how has it been um, um, commented when you have presented it to other companies? Uh, good question. And I, I wish that it was so that more companies use the same kind of platform, because as I said, I think it's a win-win situation. If more can do this, more will benefit, and those benefits will also come back to the companies. One main issue is, of course, the uncertainty of intellectual property rights. We're still in a, in a business model where we need to patent, we need to control the IPR, we need to really kind of fit everything in, into the current business model. And if that doesn't work, then it's, uh, it's easier to be hesitant. 
So more companies will probably start looking into this when they can separate core business from exportive science. And that is what we've done here. We still have barriers for the traditional science aspects, but in the early research, we can open up and do it differently. So I guess uh, it's, it's a time thing, I think, right now, and a way of accepting that you can do things differently and what the cost is to do things differently. I think it's a matter of time. And what I hear from when I speak to the larger companies, they all want to do things different. They want to find new partners to collaborate. They're a bit shy on how to do it yet. Okay, yeah, great initiative. And I, I hope it will be copied at more places. Thank you. So a question to Anna. Anna, you mentioned the need for strategies to move from short-term to more long-term projects and visions. So what is your advice for academic or private sector users on how to make this transition and plan for drug development projects so they not end already after the short-term goals have been achieved? So thank you. Um, I think, I mean, as, as I said already in the beginning of your program, I think you, you should uh, look what, what is in the end, uh, where am I heading and, and that you can do with both, I mean, learning about the drug discovery process, but also to do some, some modeling on, on your idea of your drug target, or, or even if you have a molecule to start with, uh, it's good to see if you can predict uh, if that is going to work, if it can, if which uh, exposure you can think you will have and so on. So I think it's, it's good to think ahead and, and plan for the different steps. But of course, if you don't have so much money, you have to decide also which is the most important step for me to, to build confidence. I know whether I should continue or not so that you see, think of this stop-go uh, way of thinking. Yeah, makes sense. So it's better to contact RISE earlier than later. That is the message. Yes, I didn't say that <laughs> clearly. <laughs> uh, yes, you can contact us early and we can have a discussion and then you can come back later. Great, thank you for that offer. Uh, Christian, you mentioned that you have a very cross-disciplinary, scientifically skilled team at Bioneer. And um, could you somehow elaborate and share your view of why you have this cross-disciplinary team and what is the value for performing cutting edge science and innovation? Yes, certainly, thank you. I, at least we think we, we do, but uh, I think that's, uh, that's, our, uh, that's our view. But anyway, uh, yes, I think, uh, I mean, we see at, at Barnia, we see uh, many different projects coming through our facility. So both from, uh, I mean, both as, both companies that are very small, uh, companies that are very large. Uh, and as I said, we also collaborate heavily on a European level in public-private partnerships. So we see uh, really many, many different projects. And, and I think uh, what is key about we have, what is becoming more and more important is that you, uh, and we at least are challenged in having uh, many different competences involved in even a rather, if you if you see it uh, on the on the paper, a rather simple project, but very quickly realize that because of the new technologies and new advancement in technology, you actually need much more uh, more much uh, I mean different skills. Uh, one good example is of course in the in the cross between uh, biologic uh, um, biology and and data. I mean, that has uh, become a massive uh, uh, need for people with that, uh, that competence that can actually uh, combine uh, data science with uh, biology. And this is also what we experience. We can invest in a very fancy screening uh, platform, but we need the people around it uh, with, with different angles uh, of scientific discipline to get it work. So again, you see the need for collaboration also not only yeah, exactly. between resources yeah, or organizations, uh, but also within your also team, within, you but need to have complementary exactly. expertise I mean, for, profiles. Exactly for for the for the uh, we have here a a partnership with a, with another Danish RTO on on artificial intelligence, 
and that is because we, we I mean, we, we don't have we don't have a, a whole department with, with people with that uh, experience, but we, we can just see that we need it. We need, we simply need to partner with people that are really clever and good at that, and combine that with our cellular models, for example, which is a good, really good example. Great, thank you. So time is a little bit running out, but I have an open question here for anyone to reply on if we have time for that. So academia and industry benefit mutually from each other, that is clear, but um, are there still academic developments, or, or this is a statement, there are still academic developments not well incorporated uh, in the industry setting. Uh, do you see ways that we can improve and make academia and industry work better together to design better workflows for certain techniques such as, for example, microscopy or protein production or what it could be. Is anyone in the panel list eager to reply on that? If I just very briefly jump in if, if from my perspective, I have a history from industry in say 15 years and now we built Testa Center, this, which is uh, open for both SMEs, larger companies and academia. Uh, and to be a little bit, you know, criticizing myself, I, I can see that we can, we still have some distance to go to be uh, uh, super client adapted for academic project. Uh, and that I think that's a re reflection of we being in an industrial setting. So I think it's, an, it's, it's very much around understanding the users of the facility. So we come from an industry, we understand the industry users, we need to work a little bit harder to understand the academic users. And from the other side as well, if you're an academic institution, you understand the academic users, you might need to work a little bit harder to understand the industrial users. And then that goes reciprocally in both ways, of course. That's my take on it. That's uh, to understand the users of the facility, really. And I think, uh, sorry to interrupt, but the time is, is actually up. And I think this will have to be the last uh, word for this uh, session. Uh, collaboration is, is really good. That's absolutely clear. I think we have some fantastic resources, both driven from the private sector and from the public and, and the non-for-profit uh, sector as well. Thank you so much, Kaisa, for doing a fantastic job as our moderator of today. And thank you all the speakers for taking your time. It's highly appreciated. And last but not least, thank you to all of you who participated today. And I hope that we can see each other in a physical setting next time. But until then, stay safe, take care, and uh, follow us on LinkedIn and our newsletter so you can stay updated on what's happening next. Thank you so much, everyone, and take care. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.